This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So today's Grand Round speaker is Dr. Jamil Abola-Hossen, who is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the UCLA Department of Medicine and Director of the Anson UCLA Adult Congenital Heart Disease Center. He received his MD from UCLA and his residency in internal medicine and a general adult cardiology fellowship were at Harbor UCLA Medical Center followed by an adult congenital heart disease fellowship, congenital interventional fellowship at the Anson UCLA Adult Congenital Heart Disease Center. He is currently funded by the Anson Foundation to develop the interventional program in adult congenital heart disease and to upgrade the CAT lab with 3D CT MRI technology and develop and maintain a database at UCLA. He's involved in a number of multi-center clinical research trials and is the founding member and president of the Association of Adult Research in Congenital Cardiovascular Diseases. He's been the recipient of several awards, including a Division of Cardiology Excellence in Teaching Award, and in 2013, he was named the Streisand American Heart Association Chair of Cardiology. He's published about 40 peer-reviewed articles and 10 book chapters, and the title of his talk today is Interventions for Adults with Congenital Heart Disease. Dr. Abul Hassan. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Dr. Devarskar. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, frankly, I wouldn't be able to give this talk if it wasn't for the uh, mentorship and uh, collaboration of many of the faculty in pediatric cardiology here uh, and uh, uh, congenital cardiac surgery. But specific thanks go to uh, my friend and mentor, Dr. Dan Levy, who was supposed to be in here, but he may have run off, actually. Uh, there, he's walking in right now. There he is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're not allowed to have coffee with uh, anyway, but but it's it's uh, it's just been an absolute a pleasure to to be here for uh, nearly a, a decade, working hand in hand uh, with uh, the pediatric cardiology division, and I think we've been able to do some wonderful things together uh, and help a lot of our patients. Today, I'm going to talk to you about interventions for adults with congenital heart disease. Uh, the only uh, disclosure that I have that's pertinent to this talk is that I am a consultant for GE Medical, um, the company that uh, has installed the imaging equipment in our cath labs. And so uh, we uh, are serving in some capacity as a beta site for some of their uh, technology, and I'll show you some of that later uh, as part of this talk. Um, I'd like to start with a historical perspective. Um, regarding congenital heart disease, um, and specifically adult congenital heart disease, which is you know, the, the future for the patients that many of you take care of. Um, and this is what the future holds. So uh, survival into adulthood has now become the, more, uh, the norm for most types of uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, hence, the population of adults with congenital heart disease in the United States is growing um, at about 5% per year. Uh, and there are uh, now uh, estimated to be more adults than children with congenital heart disease in this country. That's not necessarily the case in um, uh, uh, countries uh, that uh, do not have uh, these types of medical systems. For example, in, in Southeast Asia and in Indonesia, um, only a few percent of children born with congenital cardiac diseases are actually intervened upon um, either as children or adults. So the survival rates there in some ways mimic survival rates in this country uh, going back to the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, uh, but 
uh, what we have seen really since the 1940s and with the advent of cardiopulmonary bypass in the 1950s is a, uh, an exponential increase in the number of uh, adults with congenital heart disease as these children have been uh, allowed to grow. We now estimate that there's about 1.3 million adults with congenital heart disease in this country, 20,000 new patients per year coming into the system, uh, and there are now more adults uh, than children. And most of them, two-thirds, have moderate and complex congenital heart disease. We're not talking here about the, the small ASDs or the uh, bicuspid aortic valves. Uh, we're talking about transpositions. We're talking about patients with pulmonary hypertension, patients with complex defects, patients with single ventricle physiology. Um, these are the patients that need a lot of the care. Much of the credit for the success of the field goes to the early surgical pioneers, uh, such as Blaylock, Crawford, and Gross, uh, and um, many others, uh, starting really in the late 1930s and 1940s. By the 1950s, advances in cardiopulmonary bypass allowed surgeons to operate on the open and non-beating heart, and that really catapulted cardiac surgery to the forefront of uh, medical advancement. You know, the golden age of cardiac surgery was in the uh, 50s and 1960s, uh, you know, the, the uh, first operations to replace a pulmonary valve, to fix a VSD, to fix an ASD, uh, these were huge milestones. So by the turn of this century, uh, cardiac surgery had become a refined art, and anything that we do in the cardiac cath lab really has to be compared against that standard. Um, transvascular catheterization techniques were first developed uh, as early as the 1930s, but were generally used for only diagnostic purposes until the 1960s. Early transvascular catheter interventions were limited by a number of factors, uh, including a lack of biocompatible materials that could be crimped into delivery catheters and then delivered at the appropriate location. Um, this is an example of an early type of intervention, and I. Uh, uh, took this uh, specific um, uh, fluoroscopy loop from uh, Dr. Levy, and you wonder what is going on here. It looks like there's something that's blown up in the heart, and then somebody's tugging on it, and then it, it sort of rips uh, right through the interatrial septum, and that's what this is. This is a patient with complete transposition of the great arteries. Two circulations are in parallel. Blue blood is uh, making its way to the body. Red blood is just recirculating through the lungs, and there needs to be some sort of unobstructed communication. Uh, and one way to do that is to actually create a large ASD. And the way to do that is by doing this Rashkin septostomy procedure. Uh, and uh, this was uh, first performed in 1966, but this is what we're looking at as the, really the, the beginning of interventions in this, uh, in this field. Now, the last two decades have witnessed just an explosion of percutaneous trans uh, catheter interventions, and they've been catalyzed by several key factors, which I've listed here, uh, five major factors as I see it. One uh, would be advances in non-invasive imaging techniques, such as echocardiography. Really, transthoracic echocardiography is the, is the workhorse for cardiology, whether it be pediatric or adult cardiology. Without transthoracic echo, we would not be here. But add to that cross-sectional imaging techniques like MRI and CT that have allowed us to really take very complex structures and be able to visualize them in three dimensions and understand uh, you know, how uh, the heart in a patient with dextrocardia and transposition actually sits within the chest. Um, so advances in non-invasive imaging, number one. Number two, advances in catheter, device, and wire design have allowed us to easily engage unusually located vessels, be able to wire those vessels, uh, be able to deploy devices within these vessels, open them or close them uh, should the need arise. And then, you know, more recently, really insert valves uh, into areas where either there is no valve or there's a dysfunctional valve. Number three, new materials, um, and there are a variety of new materials. Dr. Levy is, is uh, you know, internationally recognized for attempting to develop new materials uh, for use in this, uh, in this sphere, uh, but really the, the one that has made the biggest difference for us is nitinol, a nickel titanium alloy, uh, a metal that has uh, uh, properties of super elasticity. 
uh, deformability. You can pull it into a catheter, you can push it out of a catheter. So it allows you to go through a person's artery with a five or six French uh, uh, catheter and deliver a device that is uh, 24, 25 millimeters in diameter into the heart. Um, that was not possible before the advent of nitinol. Number four, advances in imaging um, within the cath lab. Um, better fluoroscopic equipment, transesophageal echo in the cath lab, intracardiac echocardiography, things that allow us to visualize what we're doing and look at our results right away and use multiple modalities, not just using x-ray and angiography, but also adding ultrasound. And now more recently adding to that uh, CT and MRI technology, which is something that we've been trying to work on here at UCLA. Uh, and then number five, the idea that, you know, surgeons and cardiologists don't operate in separate spheres, but we have much more in common. And when we actually put our uh, hands together, we can do things for our patients that neither of us can do alone. And so that's this arena of hybrid procedures. And I'll show you some examples of those. So, um, you know, what are the the... Well, before I get to the advantages of transcatheter procedures over surgery, I do have to say this, that um, surgery still has a role. It has a very important role. The, the role of cardiac surgery has not diminished at all with the advent of transcatheter techniques. As a matter of fact, if you don't have a good, capable surgeon that is able to do the traditional operative interventions, you are going to uh, really open yourself up for trouble. You need a surgeon that can repair a valve. You need a surgeon that will operate on patients where a transcatheter technique is not an option. However, what are the advantages of transcatheter techniques? Well, it's pretty obvious. If you can close an ASD with a little tiny hole in the femoral vein as compared to uh, via sternotomy, what are the advantages? A shorter hospital stay, right? I just saw Shannon O'Kelly walk in. Shorter hospital stay, right? So we don't take up a lot of hospital beds. Right, uh, costs less, shorter recovery time, minimal scarring, and then for patients, very importantly, less pain, shorter recovery. Hey, you can go to ba back to work next week as opposed to having to be off for six weeks. These are major things for adults. I mean, they're, they're important for children, obviously, missing school and such, but if somebody runs their own company and their family is dependent on them to make a living, and we're telling them, you know what, you're going to be out of action for the next six months here because we're putting you through high-risk surgery. Well. You know, that's not the case with transcatheter techniques. And then hybrid interventions can again combine our various uh, um, strengths. Um, let's talk a little bit about some nitinol closure devices. And I just put here a, a whole series of images of various devices that have, that are currently available or have been available in the past to allow us to uh, close various holes in the heart. Uh, this is the uh, Amplatz or septal occluder. Uh, which I like to call the AK-47 of congenital heart disease. Why do I do that? Um, well, anybody who knows anything about military history and, and about weapons knows that the AK-47 uh, is one of the most reliable weapons. You can use it in snow, you can use it in ice, you can put it in mud, you can put it in sand. Uh, a 12-year-old can fire it and clean it. It's, it is, this is the uh, single most useful device that has really changed uh, the course of uh, uh, treatment of atrial septal defects and to a certain extent ventricular septal defects. And then there are a series of other modifications made by other companies that have less or more nitinol within them. Let's talk about closing a hole in the heart. This is an atrial septal defect in a woman in her 40s, uh, not diagnosed before. This is a 3D rendered image uh, from a CAT scan uh, where we've essentially cut away the left atrium here, the lateral wall of the left atrium and the left ventricle, and we're looking at the atrial septal defect um, from the left side. You can see that this is almost a common atrium here. Um, well. We went ahead and closed this here, and this is one of the very first ASD devices that I, that I put in as a, as a general fellow at Harbor, actually. And um, the reason I like to show this is this woman did fine, but this is exactly the kind of hole that you don't want to close using a device like this. Um, because if you look closely at the CAT scan here, there is no posterior rim here. There's no posterior inferior rim for the device to hang on to. So what did the device do? 
the left atrial disc of the device is digging into the back wall of the left atrium, essentially slowly eroding through the back wall of the left atrium. Uh, now, this is scarred over. This woman never had a clinical erosion, didn't have a pericardial effusion, but as we've grown and learned, we've learned that we don't actually close these kinds of holes using devices. This is the kind of uh, hole that you want to actually have a surgeon close, put a patch in, into this. But a um, good example of um, you know, the limits of an ASD closure. Um, I just want to show you some examples of the imaging that we use. This is a transesophageal echo after an ASD device has gone in, and you can see it straddling the inner atrial septum here. And we now have the ability to use 3D uh, imaging in the echo lab to look at the device on FOSS here, or here, I'm gonna stop this, um, or to look at it uh, as it straddles the septum here. There's the mitral valve. You can see if the device is in any way impinging the mitral valve. You can look at how it straddles the aortic root, make sure that there's no erosion into the aortic root. So. You know, 3D imaging, very useful, um, a little bit gimmicky in a way. Do you absolutely need it? No. But um, when uh, relationships, three-dimensional relationships are somewhat challenging, 3D imaging can really be helpful, specifically for the mitral valve. There are some um, unique things that happen uh, to adults as they age that are not necessarily faced in children um, to the same degree. One thing is diastolic dysfunction, okay? A decrease in left ventricular compliance as we all age. We will all have diastolic dysfunction if we live long enough. All of us will. Um, you know, there's even now uh, this whole wave of uh, heart failure preserved ejection fraction. What is that? That's diastolic dysfunction. So what happens to the 75-year-old with an undiagnosed ASD who has lived their entire life with an atrial septal defect and now also has left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. Well, you go, well, you know, let's just go ahead and close the ASD. Well, if you just go ahead and close the ASD, you go from a left atrial pressure here, and this is actually a wedge pressure, so a, uh, an estimate of the left atrial pressure of about 13 millimeters mercury, and then you say, okay, I'm gonna put a wire across this ASD here. You can see this wire crossing. I'm gonna go ahead and just balloon occlude this ASD. And when we balloon occlude the ASD, we see all of a sudden the pressure waveform changes completely. You have these huge V waves. The mean pressure rises by more than 10 millimeters mercury. If I just closed this ASD on this patient, I would put them into left heart failure their left atrial pressure would rise from 13 to 25. And you try to take them uh, off the ventilator and they will be in trouble. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we've seen this, we've seen this and people have reported this. So we've uh, uh, come up with a way to handle this. Actually others describe this as well, but what we do is a very uh, um, sophisticated uh, operation where we take an Amplatzer septal occluder, and I'm being sarcastic here because it's not sophisticated at all. We basically take the Amplatzer septal occluder and we, we put some holes in it. And so what we end up doing is we take a two, three centimeter ASD, and we turn it into a five millimeter ASD. And instead of crashing that plane down, we let it land slowly. This person has lived their entire life with this shunt for us to change that milieu immediately in the cath lab and hope that they're going to do okay is a bit of a fallacy. And so we, and again, this is unique for adults, so we put a fenestration in the device, and what we end up with is this kind of thing. And you can see, that there is residual flow right through the middle of the device. And we call that a pop-off. And the left atrial pressure didn't rise any. The QP to QS ratio, the pulmonary to systemic blood flow ratio, went from 2.2 to 1 down to 1.2 to 1. Not a significant chunt. We got what we needed, and we didn't do any harm to the patient. So again, a unique situation faced in adults. Now, this is another adult with a a uh, ventricular septal defect. This is called a membranous ventricular septal defect uh, with what's called a uh, tricuspid uh, aneurysm, which is essentially the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve is plastered up against a portion of the septum. And instead of the defect being this large, it cones it down almost like a windsock for it to be a smaller defect. Now, this patient, her entire life has been told that she has a restrictive VSD and nothing needs to be done about it. Well. It's not that simple. 
because years later, decades later, even that volume load, that QP to QS of 1.4 to 1, can end up causing the patient to feel breathless, develop some pulmonary hypertension, and have some elevation in their left ventricular filling pressure. And so, if you just looked at echocardiography for this patient, you would say, well, this patient needs to go to surgery, because there's the VSD, there's the aortic valve right there. If we put a device in, we're surely going to impinge on the aortic valve. Well, this is where there are some limitations to echocardiography, and I believe it's always best to take this type of patient to the cath lab and actually do angiography and see what the true relationships are. Because once you actually do that, you will see that the aortic valve is all the way up here and the VSD is down here. And then you'll see this here in the lateral plane as well. So you see how much further south the true VSD truly is from this aortic valve. And then we go ahead and <clears throat> use a somewhat of an involved technique of essentially building a railway through the heart. We call this a wire rail. We put up a catheter from the femoral artery, cross the VSD from the left ventricular side, put a wire up into the pulmonary artery, put a snare up from the femoral vein, get that in the pulmonary artery, snare it, and then bring it back the way we're showing you here. And you'll see as we pull it back, we create what's called a wire rail. And that gives us enough support, essentially a railway track, that will allow us to deliver our heavy equipment to um, the site that's needed, which is where the VSD is. And then we put a device across the VSD and we close it off. And uh, this works beautifully. The VSD is gone. Patient did well. Very low risk of heart block or any complication like that. There's a VSD device there afterwards with the transesophageal echo showing that it's really nowhere near the aortic valve. And then before the patient goes home, we do a transthoracic echo. And it looks like uh, there's some sort of alien in this uh, patient's heart. But uh, nope, it's the VSD device. And it stays like this and endothelializes over time. We also, in congenital heart disease, and specifically in adult congenital heart disease, often have to sort of beg, borrow, and steal equipment from other specialists in order to help our patients, because very few companies make devices specifically for adults with congenital heart disease. The population is growing, and now there's a lot more interest. Um, uh, but uh, we still use equipment from, uh, made for other purposes. For example, these stent grafts here are made for abdominal aortic aneurysms and iliac aneurysms. And so we've decided that, well, gosh, this is pretty useful here if you have a really bad leaky fontan like this one where fontans are, are procedures that are performed in people with only one functional ventricle. So that pump gets used to pump blood to the body. You need a way for blood to get to the lungs, so you essentially connect the inferior and superior vena cava, cavi, surgically to the pulmonary artery. What do we have here? We have a leaky fontan. This patient's very desaturated and was actually sent up here from the Naval Hospital in San Diego for a heart-lung transplant. So we looked at her and we said, ah, you know, maybe there's something that we can do for you here. So we decided, along with our... Um, you know, it's very important in our field to also collaborate with others, interventional radiologists, vascular surgeons, EP folks. You know, everybody brings something to the table. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we achieve more by doing things together. So what we did was we laid one covered stent in here, and then we laid a second covered stent inside that covered stent, and we essentially rehabilitated this fontan, and now we do an injection here, and there's no residual shunt, minimal at least. So her saturations went up from about 68% up to the high 80s, 88%. She went home. She's alive and well now, many years later, without a lung or a heart transplant. So um, there are also various devices that we use in order to occlude abnormal communications. Like, for example, in this patient with a Fontan, what you have here is a venous collateral that's developed from the innominate vein where this catheter is down into the coronary sinus of this patient. And this is causing this patient to be desaturated. And so we went ahead and put a bunch of fibered coils in here that uh, were originally developed actually for neuro interventions. And uh, actually, Dan deserves a lot of the credit for this, for essentially finding these coils and then for us uh, essentially using them to uh, occlude these very difficult uh, to get to collaterals. And you see that uh, the collateral is now blocked and um, the embolic risk goes down, the saturations can climb. 
The Melody transcatheter pulmonary valve, this has been revolutionary. Um, first designed and implanted in man uh, around 2000 by Philipp Bonhoeffer in England, and then slowly released in Europe and eventually brought to the United States and FDA approved under a humanitarian device exemption in the US in 2010. So uh, we started, Dan and I started putting these in uh, in October 2010, and um, I think this week we are somewhere around 150. Um, along with the Kaiser folks who are now bringing a lot of their patients here for these melody valve implants. But these are the jugular veins of these cows in Minnesota and in the Dakotas that contain a valve that is the size of a human pulmonary valve. So they take these uh, jugular venous cuffs, um, they treat them, and then they suture them onto a stent platform. And this is what you get. And then we take this and we can put it into the pulmonary position. Actually, we can put it in any position, um, but it's meant for the pulmonary position, but we also have a, an IRB to use it in the tricuspid position, and we've done a number of those, and, uh, as well as the aortic position. Um, but the criteria for its use are pulmonary stenosis or regurgitation of a dysfunctional conduit. This is from a uh, review paper that we wrote a couple of years ago on how to do this. But essentially, you take this, uh, this valve, uh, you have to wash the uh, uh, preservative off of it. Uh, you then load it onto a balloon-type uh, catheter, uh, and uh, you cover it with this plastic covering. And then you insert, or you insert that into the patient's femoral vein. And this is an example of a dysfunctional conduit here and a melody valve going up within the conduit. And then thereafter, there's a residual narrowing of the melody valve. A high pressure balloon is used to inflate that even further. And the patient now has a new valve. So that's how you use it in a conduit. This is how you use it in a dysfunctional bioprosthetic pulmonary valve. This is a patient of ours that has severe pulmonary regurgitation. Seen right there on the lateral view, this is the AP of that. So you can see just blood sloshes back and forth, back and forth from the pulmonary artery to the right ventricle. And so we go through the process of um, implanting the melody valve, and there's the melody valve going up within this dysfunctional bioprosthesis. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. These are, when you have a dysfunctional bioprosthetic valve, you know, you never want to call anything a layup, but this ends up really becoming a much simpler procedure because you have a good landing zone there, you know exactly where to land the valve, and most of the valves in these positions are not too large for a melody. And now compare this to this. Look at the amount of regurgitation you had here, and no regurgitation there. So great short and intermediate term performance uh, of this valve. One of the Achilles heels may be uh, the risk of infection with these valves. So we're very careful not to put it in the people who are actively infected. Um, we have them go and get their teeth checked and have any uh, 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 infections completely treated. And I'm very hesitant to put this valve in the people who've had a prior history of endocarditis. Uh, because of that risk. So do you need a bioprosthetic valve or a conduit, a dysfunctional bioprosthetic valve or a dysfunctional conduit to put this valve into? The answer is no. This is an example of somebody who doesn't actually have any uh, um, conduit or valve in their RVOT, but they have supravalvar pulmonary stenosis right at the area where the RPA and LPA are branching. And so you would think, well, it'd be difficult to actually get a melody in there without obstructing one of the branch PAs. Well, it turns out that we are actually able to get away with that. This is what it looked like before. This is where the true pulmonary valve annulus would be. And you can see that the pulmonary stenosis is much higher up here. And the PAs branch right there. And so we first go ahead and put in an uncovered stent um, just to stabilize everything. And inside of this, we deploy our melody. And there's the melody valve in there, and this is all by transthoracic echo. Um, and uh, this patient did very well, and we saved them what would have been a uh, very extensive surgical procedure. Um, this is a, um, an example just from a few weeks ago, actually, where we did the first um, uh, two-valve uh, replacement procedure. Uh, using the melody valve. So this patient had a dysfunctional pulmonary valve 
and a dysfunctional prosthetic tricuspid valve. And so we brought him to the cath lab and we said, okay, well, you know, instead of only replacing one valve, why don't we just fix both valves? And that's exactly what we did. Here's the tricuspid valve, which leaks. You can see when there's an injection here that there is regurgitation. You'll see it in a moment, come back around. See that tricuspid regurgitation there, plus there's tricuspid stenosis seen on TEE here. You can see the flow acceleration through the tricuspid valve. So we go ahead and we try to balloon size uh, both of these uh, valves. This is actually not even a bioprosthesis here. This is just a ring that a surgeon had put in many years ago called a Carpentier ring. Uh, so we didn't actually know whether the Melody valve would work that well in this location, but uh, we figured that uh, it actually would. And we were right because we put the Melody valve here first in the pulmonary position, and that's a straightforward procedure, very well established. And then we put the Melody valve here in the tricuspid position, and here's an injection afterwards, no leakage whatsoever. Functioned beautifully, uh, the man's doing great, went home um, uh, a day later. And then this is what it looks like with three-dimensional TEE. So, you know, we're just slowly pushing this envelope. Um, first you start with one valve just in a conduit, then to bioprosthetic valves, now to rings. Um, and then we use uh, this three-dimensional imaging technology now, rotational angiography, which essentially means that you take the, the um, uh, X-ray tube and you rotate over a five-second period around the patient uh, to uh, almost 200 degrees. Um, and you inject contrast into the heart. You have to pace the heart quickly so you drop the cardiac output so the, con the contrast doesn't fly off over those five seconds. So what you're essentially trying to do is freeze the heart and do this uh, spin around it, and then you take that info and you do a three-dimensional reconstruction. And this is a patient with Tetralogy of Fallot and a dysfunctional conduit here. There's a narrowing of this conduit here, and there's also severe pulmonary regurgitation. And there's branching here of the pulmonary arteries. You can see the RV filling here with the severe pulmonary regurg. Then we say, okay, we're going to put a valve in here. But before we do, we have to make sure we don't compress the coronary arteries. So we put up a balloon. And you can see here, this is, again, a three-dimensional spin on an aortogram. Um, and, you know, for, for those of you that, that spend time in the cath lab and see what traditional AP and lateral angiography looks like, this is, this is the next step here. I mean, we, we're still sort of, the, the technology is a little bit cumbersome. I like to tell the GE folks that it's almost like an early version of Pac-Man, you know. Um, but I can see, you know, how this in the next 10 or 15 years is going to be, uh, uh, you know, World of Warcraft 4 because it's just going to get better and better. Um, and for us to only be using two planes to do these interventions, um, I think is, is uh, uh, you know, that's going to change very quickly. And uh, I like to show this image a lot because people really like it because it, it really shows the relationship of this right ventricular outflow tract that's dysfunctional here. The balloon is blown up within it. You can see that there's a little waste on the balloon. We've lightened the contrast inside the balloon so it looks like a little bit more... Um, um, uh, it, it's, it's not as dense as you would usually see, but the reason for that is so that we can see the coronaries well, and you can see the left coronary here emerging and running right under the balloon, and you can see that there's no compression of the left coronary with this balloon. So very important information for us, and uh, gives us a beautiful coronary angiogram, actually. You know, the way uh, we do adult coronary angiography is we use uh, directional catheters to engage the left and the right coronary, and then we do various views, and we're using all of this contrast and all of these uh, different uh, uh, angles in order to look at the coronary, when realistically you can do one injection in the aorta and get a fantastic three-dimensional reconstruction of your entire coronary tree. But you have to be willing to pace the patient at 180 beats per minute, have them hold their breath, and inject that contrast slowly over five seconds. But this is the kind of quality that you get. Now, thereafter, we use what's called an optimal working angle 
So we, we look at this three-dimensional reconstruction, we go, you know, the best way for us to see this is to put the camera so it's really cranial, so we're looking essentially from, you know, the northwest location at this pulmonary artery. And then we do that, and we deploy our melody valve. And if you look at, you know, we didn't have much, much room for error here. If we landed a little too far, we obstruct the right pulmonary artery completely. And then we're in real trouble. So we had to land this just so, and there you see it landed exactly where the narrowing is, unobstructing uh, or not obstructing right or left pulmonary artery flow. And you can see that there's no further regurgitation here. This is contrast injected into the pulmonary artery. You don't see any contrast. This is just artifact off all the metal. You don't see any contrast in the right ventricle. Compare that to the amount of contrast that refluxed here. So that's one way we can use the 3D technology. The other way, which is difficult to do, but again, is gonna be really important in the long run, is the way we used it here. So this woman, um, who uh, is actually the first person to have a Melody valve implanted with using MRI overlay technology. Um, she's actually a professor at Caltech with Tetralogy of Fallot and Pulmonary Atresia. She was operated on as a child and has a, a dysfunctional conduit uh, and has stenosis and regurgitation of that conduit. So we did an MRI on this woman um, uh, about six months before we brought her to the cath lab. We then took the MRI data, um, which by the way, kudos to cardiovascular radiology here, Paul Finn and his group, uh, we get just some fantastic imaging from them. And it, this wouldn't be possible actually without having that imaging done by them. But we take the gadolinium MR angiogram and then we do a three-dimensional reconstruction of that. We then import that into the cath lab and we overlay it onto the fluoroscopy screen. So now what we're doing is we're working with a three-dimensional ghost of the patient's heart and not just with x-ray. And so here you see the aorta and here you see the pulmonary artery right there. There's the conduit, there's the right ventricular outflow tract. And you can tell that we're pacing this patient very fast here uh, as we uh, look to ensure that our overlay is perfect with some angiography. And then we deploy the melody valve essentially using the three-dimensional model as uh, a guide. And you see this blue dot here tells me if I'm here, I'm way too far because I'm going to end up obstructing the branch pulmonary arteries. Now, what are the disadvantages of this? If you look at it, okay, the model isn't moving. It's basically just staying there. Uh, you can actually do respiratory gating of this. The problem is there's a little bit of a delay to it. Again, early Pac-Man, so it makes you feel like you want to throw up because it's very, it's kind of moving back and forth throughout that, so you need some Dramamine if you're going to use that. Um, the other problem with this technology at this point is it's not dynamic with the heart. The heart is a dynamic organ, <coughs> systole, diastole. You know, it's, it's changing. It's changing with respiration. And in order to tr truly do dynamic overlays, you have to have that simultaneous movement. Um, that we still don't have with this technology, but we're working on it, and a variety of companies are actually doing a lot of work in this area. So let me move on to hybrid procedures. These are the procedures that involve our surgical colleagues as well as us, and these are now increasingly used. Um, hybrid procedures are especially useful in the care of a patient with congenital heart disease, where the cause circulations may be complex, the physiology and anatomy can be challenging, and the patient might have had five or six prior sternotomies. So you may not want to go in the same way anymore. You may want to try something that's a lot more limited in order to actually be able to fix the, uh, the problem. And it reduces the number of, of operations uh, that require cardiopulmonary bypass in a patient's lifetime if you don't have to go on cardiopulmonary bypass. And that's important. There's a growing body of literature on the use of these hybrid technologies in uh, patients with congenital heart disease, babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, um, uh, you know, where the ductus can be stented and then a surgeon can band the branch pulmonary arteries. That's now widely used. Complex stenting procedures in patients who have unifocalizations, valve replacement techniques. And, you know, this Melody valve, um, you know, requires that a patient weigh 35 kilograms because there's a 22 French sheath that has to go through the femoral vein. Now, 
what happens if you're a six-year-old or a five-year-old and you would really benefit from a melody valve? Well, should we be limited by the fact that there are no good roads to get us to where we need to go? Well, maybe we can create new roads, and that's where Dr. Reamson or Dr. Lax or Dr. Binwali have been very, very helpful and very collaborative. And what we've done is do a, a little sub-xiphoid uh, incision. They can just reveal the, right, ventri the uh, right ventricular free wall for us, go ahead and put in some pledgeted sutures. We put in a needle, a wire, right up to the pulmonary valve, and then we can insert the pulmonary valve, come out, and all they do is cinch the sutures down. And it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, a very nice way to actually do uh, some of these procedures, um, uh, including perivalvular leaks. Instead of having to replace an entire valve just because there's a little leak around it, uh, we can go in and put in little devices in that area if they'll give us access to the LV apex. VSD closures, and then really the holy grail are the Fontan completion procedures. Um, and I showed you a little example of that with those stent grafts. Uh, let me just uh, present quickly um, a couple of cases uh, that would reflect how we use some of this equipment. This is a patient 48 years old with coarctation of the aorta, systemic hypertension, and functionally limited. So we took her to the cath lab, we do an angiogram, and you can see that there's a focal coarctation here. This woman had had an operation as a child, but as she grew up, frankly, her aorta did not grow with her. And uh, so you continue to have this residual coarctation. So we took her to the cath lab. She did not have a right femoral pulse. We ultrasounded, couldn't find anything. And this is a frequent occurrence, actually, in adults with congenital heart disease who've had a lot of catheterizations as children. You know, the brachial artery may be down, the femoral artery may be down. They've typically recanalized and they're doing okay, but it doesn't give us good access. So the right femoral artery is down, we go to the left femoral artery, and this is just an eight French sheath in the left femoral artery, completely obstructing it. There's no way I'm gonna be able to stent that coarctation through this approach. So what did we do? I should have cleaned this up a little bit more before I took a picture of it. Uh, <laughs> But so, you know, Dr. Reamson came in and did a, an incision uh, right below the right clavicle, and uh, we ended up going through that approach. So we essentially used a hybrid approach via the right subclavian artery to put a stent in that location, inflate the stent, and this is what's called the bib technique, where smaller balloon inflates first, then a larger balloon. But you can see there's still some narrowing here. So we go ahead and we use these high pressure balloons called Atlas balloons to try and open up that stent. And now it looks a lot better. We've opened it up more. And we do an injection. And we go, hold on a second. As we do a rotation, you will notice that, let me show it to you again. Look right here. The aorta has now torn. It's a pseudoaneurysm. It's a contained tear of the aorta. But we're in trouble here. If uh, we don't fix this and it continues to grow, this will rupture into the left chest of this patient. So we either have to take this patient to surgery or we have to do something. At the time that this happened, we actually didn't have any covered stents on the, uh, on the shelves. We had made some of our own that we then tried to insert, but I'll show you what happened to the one we tried to insert here. Just tore off. <clears throat> Clearly there's something to be said for things made professionally as opposed to in my garage. Um, so the melody valve can actually function as a covered stent. And so we ended up having to use it as exactly that. Cut out the valve leaflets, and now we have a covered stent. And we take it and put it right into the area where there's that contained rupture right here, and we cover that up. And so we ended up saving this patient a thoracotomy, and the aneurysm is gone. And we now have, we're part of a trial now that has allowed us to put these kinds of covered stents on the shelves to be used in these kinds of emergencies. The patient left the cath lab with a pacemaker pocket uh, incision and went home the next day. Here's a patient that was sent to us from Stanford. She was turned down for a heart-lung transplant there. She has very complex congenital heart disease, transposition, VSD, atrial fibrillation, renal failure, suspected of having liver cirrhosis, severe pulmonary hypertension, a pulmonary artery aneurysm that grew from five centimeters to 11 centimeters in the last five years. She was presented here for heart-lung transplant and people just said, are you kidding? No way. So she came to us, basically 49 years old, 
sad to say, but thrown on the trash heap. This is, there's nothing that can be done for this woman, you know? Um, but here we're lucky in that we have, again, collaborative, very creative surgeons. And in this case, we discussed this case extensively with Dr. Lax, Hillel Lax. And he said, you know, I bet you if we did this in a very fast, hybrid manner, went on pump, came off pump quickly, that we would actually be able to help this woman. And so we did exactly that. We took her to the cath lab, or took her to the operating room. Oh, this is, by the way, what her MRI looked like. This main pulmonary artery aneurysm um, with a pressure in the pulmonary artery of 100 over 40, mean of 54. She also has pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary regurgitation. Um, her pulmonary arterial resistance is 20 wood units at baseline. So we took her to the operating room, and Dr. Lax opened up the aneurysm, started working on fixing the aneurysm. At the same time, I mounted a mel melody valve onto a balloon, had to mount it upside down because we're going from the other direction, and deployed that into the pulmonary uh, valvar location. And also used that melody valve, which is a covered stent, to help cover up the ventricular septal defect that is right below her pulmonary valve. So really tried to address two things that would have taken maybe 45 minutes surgically, took about five minutes to do using a balloon technique, while he could focus on using his time to actually fix the aneurysm. Well, worked out beautifully. This is what it looked like afterwards. This woman went from having saturations of 73% to 89%, home in 10 days, back to Lodi in Northern California where they did a uh, story on her in the local paper, actually, uh, and uh, followed her around, and she was gardening and doing all sorts of things. But a good example of how a hybrid technique can address a situation that no surgeon wants to take on and no cardiologist wants to take on and definitely no transplant uh, team wants to take on. This is, again, pushing the envelope. People with hypoplastic aortic arches are very challenging. Uh, the, the operation to repair a hypoplastic aortic arch is very extensive. It requires circulatory arrest, um, uh, perfusing the brain separately during cardiopulmonary bypass, um, lots of potential risks. And this is a woman who's 33 years old that had a coarctation of the aorta, had numerous operations for that. But the final operation she, she ended up with was one where they took the, they took a conduit from the ascending aorta and they put it down into the descending aorta and essentially bypassed her entire aortic arch because of how narrowed it was. And she did well with this for many years, but she was an avid uh, uh, a biker and she ended up falling off her bike, having traumatic injury to the chest and uh, essentially all of a sudden her hypertension came back. She was much more short of breath. Lo and behold, what had happened is this conduit had gotten crushed and clotted off. And so now all the blood had to go down the aorta again and through this hypoplastic arch. And we can see that she has a resting gradient here of 40. With exercise, it goes up to 88. So what to do about this situation? Do we take this woman back for a full surgery, replace the conduit? Do we try to open up and suck out all the clot? This had been now over a year no chance of really doing that, uh, do we operate on her aortic arch? She came to us actually from OHSU, from, um, uh, from Oregon, uh, where they had recommended another operation. She said, you know, uh, if you guys maybe, we've heard you think out of the box, can you do something for us? So this is where um, we went to Dr. Quinones in vascular surgery. We said, what if you bypassed the carotid here? You did a carotid to carotid bypass. And then what if together we went ahead and we put a covered stent into the aortic arch and opened up the aortic arch that way? Uh, we would save her cardiopulmonary bypass. She'd end up with a relatively small incision here, much lower risk procedure. So that's exactly what we did. Went to the OR. He bypassed the carotid here. We went ahead and put a covered stent graft in here. These are the ones that are used for aortic aneurysms. The problem with these stent grafts, they're great for covering things, but they lack radial strength. They're made of nitinol, they're self-expanding stents. So alone, they're not able to open up an aortic arch. But if you take the other types of stents, the stainless steel stents that we use for coarctations and for pulmonary arteries, and you put those inside the covered stent, now you have all the advantages. You've got the covering, plus you've got the radial strength. And so that's exactly what we did. We went ahead and we put 
these Palmaz Genesis stents, these stainless steel stents, inside the covered stent grafts. So we had the protection of a covering so we wouldn't tear the aorta. We were really able to go to very high pressures, 14, 15 atmospheres, and open up the entire aortic arch. Now, this would be great if it could be an option for children, but as of now, it isn't. And the main reason for it is you need a 20 French sheath in the femoral artery to be able to do this kind of thing. So for an adult, we can do it. For a child, that's a little too big. But again, a child approach to a hybrid technique, um, that could be a different story. So this is what uh, this woman's aorta looked like uh, afterwards. This is a 3D reconstruction uh, of the uh, CT scan. And you can see the covered stent graft here. And up here, right up here, I'll stop it right there. Right up here is that carotid to carotid bypass. OK? Um, so great way to fix that. This is a patient in whom uh, Dr. Lax just couldn't get to this VSD because of the complexity of the anatomy. So he had to come off pump after fixing the mitral valve and replacing a conduit uh, from the atrial position without being able to close this VSD uh, because he would have had to go through a right ventricular um, incision here. So instead of doing that, we use a catheter and we put in two VSD devices. We can do that right in the operating room through the RV free wall. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. And this was a relatively small hole, so not a big deal there. But even huge holes. This is a post-MI VSD in a patient with a coarctation. He had had a myocardial infarction and ruptured his septum. This man was so sick, he was at, on death's door. He actually had two Centromag pumps in, really, really ill. Um, so you look at this hole and you go, there's no way a device can close this hole. But the answer is you don't know till you try. So here's where we go in through the RV free wall using the largest Amplatzer septal occluder we have, that Kalashnikov rifle that I told you about. There it is in use. And we're putting it right there. And then we end up deploying it into the VSD. And lo and behold, it actually holds. There's a little tricuspid regurgitation, but even a huge hole like this can potentially end up looking like this. Sure, you have a gigantic device in your uh, inner ventricular septum, but at least uh, you survive. So what are the conclusions? Conclusions are the transcatheter interventions in patients, adults and children with congenital heart disease are feasible and they're beneficial. You have to have mastery of diagnostic catheterization uh, techniques. You have to have good non-invasive imaging. You have to have a team approach. You have to understand uh, advanced uh, um, uh, disease. You have to have an advanced understanding of very complex anatomy. Um, and uh, every year, our imaging armamentarium is growing. We see things better. We're able to do more. Um, the advent of these hybrid approaches, us working in collaboration with the surgeons, has also been a huge move forward. So, you know, the future, I think, is very, very bright for adults with congenital heart disease. Um, uh, the population is growing. Collaboration between adult specialists and pediatric specialists is absolutely key. There's no way we would be doing this in our adult congenital patients if we didn't have a John Moore here or Dan Levy here. You know, the, these, are, these are patients that have grown out of the pediatric realm. And so therefore, our touchstone for adult congenital heart disease has to remain that. It's very, very important. That continuity is absolutely key. That's why transitioning patients appropriately is really key. Um, so um, in the end, collaboration between all of us, between surgeons, cardiologists, can only be good for our patients. I wish uh, this picture included more people because I think a lot more people deserve credit for the work that we're doing here. But you have Dan Levy there, Hillel Lax there, and there I am after doing one of the hybrid procedures. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.